um, thanks for attending. So we're here to discuss about the um, future of mobility ecosystems, and we're welcoming three major international groups who um, each of them have very traditional industries um, in, in transport. So Jan Martey is the CEO of uh, Via ID, which is um, the incubator and investor of Mobivia, a car repair group. Um, Will Farrelly is uh, in charge of um, UX user experience innovation at Ford Smart Mobility. And uh, Jan Lerich is uh, the group chief performance officer at Transdev. So um, urban mobility is going through a deep uh, disruption for two main reasons. First is the change of behaviors. Young generation don't want any more car ownership. And the second um, is technology disruption. So the, the, the future will probably be uh, shared, autonomous, and um, electric. Um, for those reasons, the traditional companies have to adapt and change their ecosystems. So um, it's going to be true in to be interesting to see how those, um, the, those groups took the turn and um, how they're trying to change internally also the culture. Maybe, uh, Jan, you can start to explain us if it's internal change, if it's external change through um, investment in startups or both. Okay, so uh, let me go back a little bit in the past uh, to, uh, to show you the dynamics of what's happening today. So to make it simple, a few years back, uh, the mobility area was quite simple. You had on one side uh, private cars, and we can also put taxi on this uh, category, and on the other side, public transport. So both of them had uh, advantages and also uh, limitations. Now the landscape is completely changing. We have in the middle uh, a lot of new modes of transportation, uh, car sharing, uh, ride sharing services, uh, you know, blah, blah, car, a lot of new services, Uber, of course. So there are many, many ways today to move from A to B. So th this is the first uh, impact uh, of the uh, digital revolution, especially. And the second uh, transformation that we face today uh, is the fact that uh, we've got a lot of choice today, but too much choice in the end kills the choice. We don't have uh, 25 apps on our iPhone uh, to, uh, to, to, to use uh, a lot of different services every day. So a new kind of services are uh, emerging on top of transport services. We call them uh, mo mobility as a service, which is a uh, global mobility services that will allow people to move from A to B uh, using many different modes of transportation, but only one service that will inform them, allow them to book a trip and to pay for that trip and also, we can imagine a lot of new services. So for Transdev, we were uh, a few uh, years ago or months ago just a transportation company focusing on taxi and public transport. So now uh, we face new competitors in that field, new company inventing new services for transport. And then there is also this new layer that I mentioned, mobility as a service, where also uh, a lot is happening today. So for us, the challenge is both to innovate on the transport side and on the mobility side. And to do so, uh, we quickly noticed that we were quite good at uh, doing innovation, I would say incremental innovations, uh, probably uh, like uh, many large uh, companies. But when it came to uh, imagine a disruptive innovation, we quickly saw that we were not that good. Uh, in fact, we were probably too good at our core business to be able to break all the rules that we made, uh, that we invented internally to be good at our core business, but those specific rules uh, that enables us still today to be very efficient at operating, for example, a bus network, those specific rules are the ones that are preventing us uh, from being very efficient when it comes to uh, innovate, uh, disruptive innovation, where we need to invent completely new services with, of course, a different set of rules. So that's why we created internally a new, um, a new division within Transdev. We called it uh, the Digital Factory, which is led by Raul Kumar that you might have heard this morning when he presented the, uh, the catalog uh, project that we, uh, that we just uh, launched. And this uh, Digital Factory is actually a company within the company, uh, a new small Transdev within Transdev with a completely new set of rules which is there just to focus on one specific kind of innovation, which is disruptive innovation. So you're pointing out a um, real issue is the culture of the group. 
we were, well, we were uh, talking about that earlier. Maybe you can tell us how you're managing this cultural shift internally. Uh, sure. So uh, Ford, it's been around for 110 years as an automotive uh, vehicle manufacturer, retailer, designer. Um, and uh, you can imagine we've got a lot of uh, experience and skills uh, around you know, creating those products. Um, the mobility space is different. It's, uh, it's very new to Ford. And uh, it's also you know, it's a relatively young sector. It's, uh, you know, it's very fragmented. There's lots of different innovative solutions. And um, because of that, there's, uh, there's masses of opportunities. And uh, the nature of the projects um, are quite different in terms of risk, actually. So for uh, you know, a company like Ford with our experience around vehicles, when we start a vehicle project, we have a very good sense of the type of product or service which will come out of the end when we start, whereas mobility is actually quite different. We start with you know, potentially more of a hypothesis about the outcome. Uh, there's more risk around the nature of the product. And so the behavior and skill set of the team it needs to be different. And, uh, and we can accelerate that learning and capability through collaboration with companies. Either it can be a large tech company or it can be a small startup or a venture. And, and this actual behavior change and, and, uh, and engaging with risk as a, as a way to deliver innovation is a big part of the, of the Ford Smart Mobility Initiative. Thank you. So you're, you're both doing in a disruption inside and outside by investing in, in startups. Exactly. Jan, you have a quite different approach because you have a, a, in the group Mobivia a strong uh, investment fund. Um, so it's mainly by acquisition? Uh, so uh, Mobius Group is uh, well known by two brands named uh, Maidas and Noroto. So it's a car repair company, uh, much younger than Ford. It has been created in the 19th century, 70s, so only uh, 50 years ago. And the change is uh, twofold. One is internally in the tr core business to try to focus on new ways of a uh, new, new approach or new uh, thing that the clients want, like electric car, like uh, um, new type of offers, um, more ecological, cheaper, because people uh, rely more on, uh, le less on cars and more on uh, different needs of uh, transportation. And on the other end, we've been created five years ago via ID, which uh, is a uh, not just an investment firm, but more than that, we call it a business accelerator because we invest in startups. We also create startups. So now we have a portfolio of 10 companies. Two of them have, has been created and eight of them are um, minority investment. But we don't put just money uh, in companies. We do a lot of uh, efforts. We have a team of 12 people, um, people who are expert in marketing, HR, uh, finance, uh, legal, etc. We combine uh, the, the companies. We also have a global network. We have an office in San Francisco. We soon uh, will have an office in uh, China. So we can help the startup to develop not only in Europe, but uh, on a global basis. So the idea is really that the, the market now is a global market and a startup can not easily, but can now reach a global market uh, if the startup has, a, has the right partners. So this is part of the things that we, we uh, give to the startups. So maybe to make it a bit more concrete to the audience, could you uh, each of you present one service you're working on? Because we're talking about mobility as a service, but uh, maybe it's interesting just to give some examples. One, one for each of you. If, if, if you're okay, I can, I can give some name of companies that we invest in, because I think it will make uh, things uh, more concrete for the people. We invest in uh, Drivey, for instance, famous uh, car sharing company. We invest in Each, famous ride sharing company. We also invest in uh, Smooth, the bike sharing company. Uh, yeah, no, it's just to, to explain that it's it's uh, it's an old industry that is um, uh, pairing right now, and um, there are some great great startups who are becoming uh, major actors now. Um, similarly, we've got. You can expect lots of projects on the go at Ford, but one in particular around mobility as a service is our uh, dynamic shuttle or go ride um, service. Then that's a, a shared dynamic uh, shuttle which can give you an almost A to almost B 
uh, trip across town at a, at a really great price and, uh, and works on demand. So this is a great new um, mobility solution and fits well into existing you know, urban transport systems. Yeah, so regarding mobility as a service, Finland is probably the country where, uh, I mean, the most advanced, many innovation uh, happened there. And so we are partners with uh, many, uh, many, uh, many other uh, players uh, there in Helsinki to create the first global uh, mobility as a service uh, provider. Uh, it's Mass Finland. And the goal there, so we just created a startup with a few uh, partners, and the goal there is to offer a single service which will allow you uh, to compare all the modes of transportation in Helsinki and around Helsinki first and then uh, in the country and to, uh, to book any trip and then to have additional services. For example, if your train is late, uh, somebody will offer you uh, a, new, uh, a new alternative without paying extra fee because it will be a, a global bundle where, where you are going to, to buy kind of insurance and be able to make sure that anywhere, anytime, you will find the best solution for you. So, Jan, earlier you mentioned that um, mobility tomorrow will be accessed through our smartphones. I mean, it's already the case, but more and more. And this is the territory of Google and Apple in, in terms of um, um, consumer interface. So, um, how will your traditional companies, I mean, uh, traditional transportation industries, will compete against those uh, tech giants? I don't know who wants to start. So it's an interesting question because for us, at the same time, if you take public transport uh, today, we know some of our clients, but not all of them. People buying uh, paper tickets, and in many places you still have paper tickets, basically we don't know them. So today those people, through our apps, we know them better and better because we offer them services, especially information services with some apps. And, and we have a new contact, but you're right. I mean, uh, we've got uh, Google, especially, and Apple also. Uh, they have, uh, first, a lot of money. Uh, they already have the relationship with the end customer, and they are aggregating more and more services. So, of course, they are a threat for us, uh, and we need to be careful in the way we, uh, we handle the relationship. At the same time, Uh, if we uh, stop by saying, okay, we won't do that because Google tomorrow by do it, uh, we don't do anything anymore because basically Google is able to do uh, almost everything uh, now or, 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 or quite soon. So uh, we believe that we've got a lot of good ideas internally. Uh, our partners, the people we work uh, with, have a lot of good ideas. We just focus on them and just focus on providing the best service to the client And then, yes, if we happen to compete directly with Google, it might be difficult, but we believe that as long as our ideas are uh, of value and as long as we really focus on the customer and offer them a good service, we have our chances to be successful. And uh, you know, just building on the, those comments, you know, uh, you know, sure, Google and Apple are large, they're incumbent, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're very strong companies, but there's no reason why we can't collaborate with them and, uh, and work with them to create uh, mobility solutions. You know, they, they provide fantastic services. That said, you know, companies like Ford have a great deal of experience in service design, vehicle design. Uh, we take a really consumer insight-led approach to designing our solutions. And at the end of the day, the experience that works best for the end user is, is, is we believe, is the one which is going to win. So it's uh, not necessarily about beating um, those guys. It's about working out where do you want to play and how can you create value in that space, both for the end user and, and the business. But do you think that traditional industries should um, make alliances to be stronger? Certainly, where appropriate, you know, there may there, it's very project specific. Some you may you may wish to ring fence particular projects where it's where it's where it works best for the business, um, but clearly, you know, um, collaboration, uh, joint ventures, uh, these sorts of initiatives help you to accelerate, um, help you to uh, leverage technology uh, rather than develop it yourself, and uh, and it's all about creating value from from a forward point of view both for the business and the customer. And that value is absolutely the, the KPI from our point of view. To, to answer the question, uh, at VID, we, we are not very much afraid of uh, Google and Apple. Bec the, the reason is, um, 
first, we, we're happy that they come on this business, on this market, because it means there is a great perspective. So the, the more people to participate and the, the, the more developments and the more good ideas are going to, to come. So we, we're happy to, to have them on, on this field. And also we consider that not competitors, but we can partner. Give you an example, we, we invest in Helio City with a Z solution. And they're, they're dealing on a, on a day-to-day -day basis with Google Map and Google solution. So it's not only competition. And one more, uh, one more example is, um, you know that uh, Apple just invested $1 billion in uh, Uber's Chinese competitor. And the reason is most of the innovation don't come from Google and Apple internally. They buy it. So as we invest in startups, uh, they are interested in what we do. And I think this is a good way to, to partner. And to give you another example, we have a startup named Ways Up doing carpooling. Ways, the, the, the American Ways, uh, just announced that they're starting the carpooling. And you know how they're going to start it? They do it on the business to business way. So they're going to sign with companies, and employees on the companies are going to participate to Ways uh, offer. This is exactly what we do in France for two years. And we, we consider it's a good confirmation that we are on the, on, on the good track with Ways Up. So I think it's a, they learn from the others, and we learn also from them. But they could invade, uh, Ways um, carpooling service could invade Europe and make Ways quickly weaker? Or would you just sell Ways, ways Up to Ways? <laughs> No, I mean, depend of the of the amount of the check anyway, <laughs> and and we are minority shareholders, so we don't decide. But more, more seriously, I think that uh, uh, com in certain ways, competition is a is, is a good way to improve. It's a good way to if if it's a, it's if it's a, a real and free competition, and if there is a exchange of idea. I was in California a month ago, and. I mean, it's, it's amazing how the ideas are, are circulating, or people are open, or you can work with people. And people don't say against, compete, or, or uh, take my ideas, or whatever. And it's going so fast that most of the people prefer to work with the others than against the others. And it's supposedly a very French uh, cultural thing to think about <laughs> competition is other than partnership. Um, to go back to your companies, the, the, um, the disruptions coming are obviously a good thing. Driverless cars um, or driverless shuttles will provide more efficient, safer uh, commuting, but it will have an impact on jobs. Um, what will the, dri the transdev drivers become? What will the car manufacturer workers become? What will the, the, the workers doing uh, repair, car repair service become? How are you anticipating this transition internally? On the Transdev side, of course, it is a, a huge challenge. Uh, we are 83,000 employees uh, in 20 countries, and more than 50% of them are drivers. So of course, the day uh, driverless cars are on the market, uh, it will be a change. Actually, it's very hard to, uh, to, um, to know today uh, what will really happen. Uh, you might know that uh, uh, one month ago uh, in Sivo, so it's close to Poitiers in France, we just started the first um, driverless car operation. So it's an EDF power plant, and there used to be there uh, one or three buses, depending on the time of the day and, and, and the year, uh, standard buses that we operated, and we replaced those buses by six Navia autonomous cars. And we had a driver there, and of course, the driver is not needed anymore to drive the vehicles. But quite quickly, we noticed that the driver is not there only to drive. Uh, the person is there also to inform people, to sell tickets, to share information, to make sure that the vehicle is clean, to, uh, to help when there is an issue. Uh, and we know that for all our other operations, for example, when you've got kids in, in the bus which are making uh, too much noise or uh, disturbing other passengers, the driver will say, hey, you stop uh, now, or I won't continue my, uh, my way. And, and so we have to reinvent uh, a way of operating vehicles without a driver. So the drivers of today 
uh, will not drive anymore in the future, but all the other services that they do today that we don't really think about because it's an add-on around driving, all of this will have to be reinvented uh, in new jobs, uh, and we are working on that today uh, to make sure that we uh, are successful in this transition, which is for us, uh, of course, uh, a very key one that we don't want to miss uh, because we are sure that uh, autonomous cars are getting, uh, are coming much faster than many people think, and I'm, I would be glad to hear you about on that, uh, because a few years back we thought that it will come, but in 30, 40 years, and as I said, already last month we started our first operation, so it's a, a, a simple one, because it's a, it's a nuclear power plant, so of course uh, people working there and using the, our shuttles are employees of a factory, I mean, they, 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 it's, it's a very uh, quiet places, place, uh, a lot of cameras everywhere, but we know that it will come on normal streets and probably, probably very, very fast. So Ford, Ford obviously, as a vehicle manufacturer, have been taking a very close look at the autonomous vehicle uh, sector and market as been predicting or, or creating scenarios about which way it might go. Um, you know, in terms of traditional vehicles, we think that market is going to actually sustain, if not even grow globally. So, still lots of jobs there. But in terms to China of the, and Africa, um, yeah, potentially very much so. Um, but in terms of autonomous vehicles, you think about a shared autonomous vehicle. It, its usage profile could be very different to a, a regular car, as in it may be active 24 hours a day, and as such, its utilisation and, and wear rate it may require you know, special maintenance. It may require you know, special manufacturing techniques, and so this disruptive technology is likely to change you know, how that car is maintained, how it's manufactured, um, and you know, there's going to be a lot of value creation and, and employment opportunities around that, for sure. Do you want to add something? Or? Ju just one thing. Uh, maybe uh, most of the people don't know that Noroto is number one in Western Europe to sell e-bikes. So a company can also move from uh, w one industry to another one or, or one type of product to another one. So um, people that don't use their car, they can use bikes sometimes. And uh, the same place where you used to maintain cars, you can maintain bikes or other type of, um, of vehicles. So there is a, a shift. And uh, Jan, maybe I have another question for you. Um, we saw that the, with, the, um, with Uber disruption, um, the governments had, uh, were quite late on adapting the laws and it, it quite messy. So are you working um, nowadays with public authorities, helping them um, um, anticipate the change? Yes, we work with them on, on a daily basis. It's both um, government, administration and local authorities. And we do that not only in France, but in Brussels and in other cities where we operate. Um, I, I would not say they are going too slow. I s would say that it's, it's first of all, it's very difficult for them to to adapt at the right speed because sometimes um, if they go too fast, it could be could be some some drawbacks because there are some models who who are not going to last, so they can't move too fast. But at a certain time, they, they need also to, to move faster. That's the example of the taxi in Paris, where they, they have not been moving fast enough. So uh, it's not becoming just a problem um, for new operators. It's, it's a real problem now for the old industry of the traditional taxi, uh, which are losing market share. It means people are less and less work and can't afford to pay the license they, they bought in the past. So by going too, f too slow, they, they m made the, the problem more eager, so it's a, it's a problem. Most of the government is very open and is asking us, different operators, to give solution. So we have very transparent discussion and we participate as much as, much as, as possible, and, but it's, it's, it's difficult to, to go at the, at the right speed. But just to give you two examples, Drivee, for instance, is working with the CNPA, that is one of the major organizations in France for transportation, and it's considered as a representative uh, to the French government. So they recognize new uh, type of business model, so it's very interesting. Or each, 
which major disruption for the transportation in Paris, uh, competing with Uber and the taxi, uh, they are recognized by uh, the government and by uh, um, uh, the representative as a significant player, so they are considered. So it, it's possible. Okay. So we have three more minutes. Are there any questions uh, in the audience? No questions. I have more questions. That's <laughs> good news. Um, so what we've, we're seeing is that the, the, the big groups are testing new services, as you said, um, trying to see how it's going to evolve. But it looks like... Um, big companies want to integrate the vertical offer. Do you think they will all compete offering all the services or time going on and on, they will specialize? I don't know if it's clear enough. <laughs> I mean, on our side, we clearly do not have the ambition to, uh, to integrate all the services. I mean, I, I think it's totally impossible. Uh, it might be possible for, for, for some tech giants, not for us. Uh, that's why uh, we are very, very pushing towards uh, first um, open data, uh, open source software. We believe in an open world where the information is accessible to everybody. Let's speak about transportation. If you want to create a new global service today to be able to go from A to B, whatever the place in Europe, for example, you need to have access to all the information regarding all the possibilities to make one part of this trip and then to aggregate all the information to provide a global offer. Two ways to do that. The first one is the private way, meaning that you are going to spend a lot of money whether to provide yourself the transportation service so it's your data and, 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 and then you organize it, or you aggregate services from other players because you are not dominant, and, and to do so, you need to have access to the data. If you take France, for example, uh, one player especially is in that dominant position and is trying to build one service of its own to be able to transport everybody from A to B with its own means or with contract with some specific uh, players and offer you this global possibility, we think it will be limited. We don't believe in that model. We believe in something which will be open. So on our side, the goal is first, as said before, uh, to be very efficient in some of the modes of transport that we operate, to be part of the global uh, trip from A to B that I mentioned, and to ourselves offer these global uh, services by aggregating data from all the, tr the, 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 the transport uh, companies to be able to offer global mobility services, but we do not imagine uh, that those two uh, jobs are the same. See what I mean? We aggregate on one side, using all the data available from us, from any players, and on the other side, we open our transport data to allow others to provide global uh, services. And you need to be good on the two layers if you want to survive. I don't believe that anybody in the end will be able to do everything by its own. Any more? Oh, okay, time, time is over. Any very, very short comment? Okay, so I hope to see all of you in October at Autonomy when we have time to go deeper in those conversations and where you will be able also to try electric bikes to autonomous cars to see the, the future of uh, mobility. Thank you.